Hello. Hi, is it Andriana? Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, perfect. I'm Jennifer. Oh, I got to change my name here. I'm Jennifer Hibbert. I'm the moderator here. Oh, wonderful. Nice to meet you. You too. Uh, I'm just type my name in here. Sec. Okay, and now I will make you a co-host. Why do I do that now? co-host okay and then hi Sydney hey, how's it going good how are you so good. Sydney you're the other yes then okay I will make you co-host as well thank you there we go okie dokie how are you guys doing Hey, how are you? Good. Oh, I'll turn my video on. I usually keep it off because it um, really bogs my internet down, but I will put it up on for now. Um, I'll just do a little intro and then hand it over to you guys. Perfect. That's me. Yeah, I'm, it's freezing. And it always, you know, when your internet freezes and it doesn't freeze when your face looks normal, it always freezes when you're making a weird face. <laughs> and then your weird face is up there for like five seconds and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, to avoid that, I just turn the camera off. I'm out in the countryside. I'm working from home right now. So um, yeah, so our internet can be a little dodgy sometimes. So okay. I'll, um, it's 1024, so I'll wait till 1030 and then and we'll get going. Awesome. Do you guys need anything? Are you doing breakout rooms or anything like that? Uh, nope, we're going to be just showcasing um, quite a few digital tools. And then at the end, I'm just gonna open it up for discussion. I had a look at how many folks were registered and I think we'll be okay to just stay in one room um, and have discussion. Um, I think there was about 14 or 15 registered last time I looked. So that's a great number okay. for us. <laughs> yeah, I like the smaller numbers. I'm trying to fix yeah. my lighting here. There you go. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And where are you guys from? I'm actually stationed in Ontario. I'm just west of Toronto. And I'm in Calgary. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you work for Green, Green Learning, is that correct? Correct, yes. I had a look at the brochure. There's some really neat tools, actually. Yeah, we have. I do course development for my school, so I'm always looking for new resources and stuff. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah, That's great. yeah, I work at a fully, well, not fully online school, but I'm in the fully online part of it. I teach secondary uh, humanities courses online. So um, <clears throat> yeah, always looking for new stuff to add to my courses. So in which case we have lots to show. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Excited to see all this. Okay. Have you been enjoying the uh, symposium so far? Yeah, George is awesome. I've seen him before. He's always very inspiring and full of great ideas. And he manages to like pack so much information into such a short amount of time. Like it, it gets a little by the end, you're like, whoa, head's kind of spinning. But yeah. um, no, it's really good. And you know, I kind of, I don't mind doing a conference from home. Like I do miss the face-to-face -face piece, but in some ways it's nice because I'm on Vancouver Island and we usually have to travel to Vancouver or somewhere, you know, fairly far away to get to a conference. So, and then you're staying in a hotel and I mean, that's fun too, but um, in some ways it's really nice to be able to just be at home and have my own snacks and my own bathroom and you know, so I don't, I haven't mind, I've been to a few conferences now online and I've actually, haven't minded it at all. Oh, that's good. Other than the, missing the, you know, the conversations that you have with people, but um, I'm kind of a conference nerd. I really like conferences. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly the same. And actually with the transition to online um, conferences, we've had the opportunity to present at multiple conferences within the same time span. So for example, um, right now I'm on a three day, three conference kind of binge where I'm presenting at oh, three cool. different conferences in the next three days. And that just wouldn't be possible with right. being Unless online. you're like 
hopping on airplanes and flying to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. Serious jet lag going on there. <laughs> For sure. Where are your other conferences that you're presenting at? Um, so I'll also be presenting at the ESTEM conference um, here in Ontario, or, or it's a national conference, I guess, um, and same with ECOM. So cool. both kind of environmental um, and digital learning spheres as well. So all relates um, very well to, to this conference or symposium as well. Great. Awesome. You know what I like about this is that I always feel guilty traveling to a conference and all of us, all the stuff that we do that isn't very green and isn't very good for the climate. Yeah. For our learning, it's good for our soul sometimes to get out. And But I do feel bad about that. I remember being at the Hotel Vancouver for a BCTF thing one time and thinking, you must be kidding. Like, we say we're so responsible and look at the, the just the sheer number of linen and towels and stuff while we were there for that, that yeah. conference. So. And, but you're right, it also expands what, who we meet and what we can do. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's good. I have a really weird setup in my office, so no one gets to see my face, it's kind of oh. <laughs> so, But I have a huge screen in the front and then the cameras to the side, so. Right, how many, you said there are 14 or 15 people signed up? Uh, yeah, I think so. Last time I looked, but I know um, I was just in the Cross Canada panel. And I don't think that they've wrapped up yet. They were um, still going. So right. um, if people come in late. That's okay. We, we can okay. get started on time regardless. Okay. Yeah, we've got eight people in here now. So yeah, so maybe um, for the folks who are already here, if you wanted to pop in the chat, um, what grade or subjects you teach, or if you're an informal educator, um, in what capacity you teach, just so I can um, really gear um, all the tools that I showcase today specifically for, for what you're looking for. Morning. I guess I should mute when I'm typing. Sorry. I forget it's morning over there. We're we're one thirty in the afternoon over here. <laughs> oh right, yeah, we're it's only ten thirty here. Mm -hmm. Social dust is awesome. Math and science, good. I love seeing these subjects. Exactly what we hit. <laughs> Awesome. Well, welcome. Independent studies, that's awesome, okay. Course development, that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> yeah, there's so much great stuff going on. That's, that's great, we've got a great group here. Well, it's it's ten thirty. So if you guys want to go ahead and get started, and we've got ten people in here now, so we must be getting pretty close. Awesome. So um, I'm going to turn my video off just to keep my internet going, but I will be here. Oh, and I will also be sharing the link to the. Um, with, there's a document. Each comp or each session has like a Google Doc that they're asking people to, or actually it might be a. I think it's an Office 365 doc, but anyway, it's a, um, a shareable document and they're asking people to put questions in their comments or anything like that so they can collect it and, and look at it after the, um, the conference is over. So I will put the link to that right into the, the chat there. So go ahead, um, Sydney and Adriana, and enjoy the session. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone. Happy Earth Day. Um, so you're here for the session, Leveraging Digital Tools for Climate Change Education. My name is Sydney Hallett and I'm the Engagement Manager with Green Learning, um, but I'm actually a formal, uh, former educator myself here in Southern Ontario. I've taught a combination of French Immersion, Core French and English for kindergarten to grade 12. Um, I focus primarily on deep and inquiry-based learning as well as incorporating coding and technology um, and robotics into the classroom. 
I'm joined today by Andriana. She's going to be dropping some links in the chat for us. If you have any questions throughout the session, um, please put them in the chat. I do have some time scheduled at the end for us to, um, for you to have an opportunity to explore the digital tools and ask any questions while we're here to support you. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in there and we will get to them at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, so typically, um, Actually, before I get started, I'll just let you know about the digital handout that we have that Andriana is going to drop both a link and the document in the chat. Um, so this outlines a number of the different links um, to the tools that I'm going to be showcasing for you. I would highly recommend you download this document um, either into your Google Drive or onto your computer and that you make notes throughout the presentation. Highlight the resources that you find would be most helpful for you. Make any notes of how you can integrate it into the classroom. Um, so this is a tool for your purpose if you're someone who likes to follow along with the digital tools, you're more than welcome to. They are, for the most part, put in order, um, but that's a, uh, just a resource for you to use throughout this process. So I typically like to start off my presentations with um, a little bit of information about green learning. So for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a national not-for-profit organization. We create free educational programs about energy, climate change, and green economy. Our mission is to engage and empower students or youth um, to create a positive change for our world. And typically I start off our presentations with a land acknowledgement and I've decided to showcase my first digital tool um, as my land acknowledgement. So as a settler, I like to honor and acknowledge the land that I work and reside on. Um, so I know most of you are coming from BC here, but I'm actually going to zoom into my area here in Southern Ontario. Um, so this tool is really awesome because you can look at the different territories and treaties of Indigenous people in Canada and actually around the world. This is a really dynamic tool for students to use. Um, they can edit all kinds of different settings here. You can add labels if your students are still working on um, getting to know Canada's map. Um, so I'm located actually right here. So as you can see by the map, um, on the treaties here, I'm located on the Haldeman Treaty, um, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. As far as the territories go, the um, traditional territory I am located on is of the Haudenosaunee, um, Attawandaron, and Anishinaabeg um, peoples. Um, and this land was all promised to the Six Nations. Um, so if you want to explore this tool, it's really fun, really dynamic, um, really interesting for students to see and all kinds of questions can come out of this, such as why so many of these territories and treaties overlap, um, looking at the different languages, uh, just a really dynamic tool to use. Um, so now I'm going to be going through a number of our programs and showcasing how we, we leverage digital tools in them and, and how you can adapt them for your lessons. Um, so all of our programs are based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are 17 goals, which are a, blue, a blueprint, sorry, for creating a prosperous future, um, both for people and the environment. This in itself is a great digital tool. So if you're focusing on one area within your class, so for example, clean water and sanitation, you can actually go to that sustainable development goal. I apologize, my internet is very slow, I guess, as well. <laughs> And within here, you actually have all kinds of resources at your disposal. So not only do you have infographics, um, events, and these are both for educators and for students, publications to learn more information. And my personal favorite part is the news section. So if you want to connect your SDG that you're focusing on uh, to current events, bring that into your language portion, just keep your students up to date. This is a great place to go and find really central information on that. I also want to showcase a tool that I just discovered today, actually, that was shared with me. Um, so this is an SD tracker. And within this, it actually has all of the information on how the world is tracking success towards these um, goals. So this is where you can find all kinds of charts, information, really the solid data of how we're tracking our progress towards this. So if you're focusing on a goal and you need some resources, this is a great place to send students to find their own information. Really centralized and this website is specifically designed for youth so the target audience is children under 18 um, so this is perfect for their use 
Um, another thing that our programs really great, make great use of is what we call the spiral inquiry. So this is a model that was developed by Green Learning, um, and it basically takes students through the inquiry process. And what I love about this tool is we actually have it built into our website for some of our programs. So what I'm going to show you here is actually our maple syrup inquiry. And this students can do right within our website or educators can just use this as a guide for setting up an inquiry with their students. So for example, we typically start off an inquiry with a spark to get students thinking and excited about a topic. In this instance, we've not only given you a question as a spark, a video as a spark, but we've also given you an idea to host a pancake breakfast in your, uh, in your classroom or with your students in order to get them thinking about maple syrup. From there, they can actually go right within this resource to the next step. So here we're going to walk them through how to create a hypothesis question. And then we also have these check in worksheets at every step of the inquiry process. So as educators, your students can download these right from the website, fill out their um, check in worksheet to make sure they're on track for their inquiry. And you can use that as an assessment tool to make sure that your students are on track, that their learning is progressing uh, accordingly. So you can assign this as asynchronous or synchronous learning. Within this particular inquiry, we, we also have all kinds of additional information. So questions that students should be considering as they're going through their inquiry, different investigation topics that they can explore. And this is just a starting point. We encourage your students to go based off of this, but to go and expand beyond it as well. And again, there are check-in sheets at every point, including the end, and ideas for your students on how they can communicate and act and really take action with what they've learned throughout this program or throughout this inquiry process. So if you're new to inquiry-based learning and you just want to dip your feet in or you're looking for something particularly structured, this is a great, um, a great tool. The inquiry model is also used throughout most of our programs. So that brings me to our first program that I'm going to showcase today, which is our Decoding Carbon program. This is a climate policy quest where we're looking at climate policy here in Canada and around the world. This program is broken up into about five different modules. Um, so these modules can be done sequentially. You can take this module and do it um, independent of the program. You can pick pieces. For example, you can just do one lesson from each of the modules. Our programs are really flexible in how you set them up and how you approach them. So we have, how does climate change, uh, what is climate change and how does it shape our world? So I know I talked to a lot of educators who maybe their students aren't quite ready to dive into climate policy, but they wanna have a really solid foundation of what climate change is and how it's affecting our world. So they'll just take this one module with their students and kind of leave the rest. Um, so be, feel free to use this flexibly and however it works with your learning model. So we have Canada's role in the climate policy, how to design a climate policy, um, and we also have some Indigenous relations in here as well. And that's consistent throughout our programs that multiple perspectives and interdisciplinary approaches are used. Um, the activity I'd love to showcase for you today is called the evolution of climate science. So this is looking at the history of how we got to the point we are today in our climate modeling and our understanding of climate change. Um, and it, it uses a couple of really awesome digital tools. So within each of our lessons, we also have backgrounders. So these are tools for you. Um, you can also have hand these off directly to your students. They are student friendly to give you that foundational base knowledge of what you need to know about this topic. So within this activity, um, the first digital tool that they use is called Carbon Brief. And this is an interactive timeline of climate policy here in Canada. Um, so starting with when weather prediction by number process started, all the way up to present day, students can explore any significant events um, in climate policy history. Within the activity, we give you a few dates and key events that we think you should focus on, but really this is an opportunity for students to really explore and find what's interesting to them. I find oftentimes students are really interested in what happened the year they were born or the year a family member was born, so you can also approach it that way. From there, students start to understand how different climate myths came about as well. And for that one, we use our skeptical science. Now, skeptical science uses scientific facts to debunk common climate change myths. And you can see along the side here that there are already a, a ton of common myths that students can explore. Something I really love about this tool is that it has both a basic and an intermediate explanation of the scientific uh, 
basis for that myth. Um, so regardless of where your students are at with their knowledge of climate change or their knowledge of even science, um, they can understand and use this tool. Um, and I would really recommend even showcasing this tool for your students, just so that they know um, in the age of uh, digital technology with students constantly being bombarded with misinformation, it's really important that they have uh, sources that they can go to in order to figure out what information that they're being shown is true and factual. Um, so another great tool. Unfortunately, I don't have time to show you all of the lessons and tools that we use in the Decoding Carbon program. So I'm actually going to skip ahead to the end of the program. So in each of the programs that I'm going to showcase today, they each have a challenge component. And the challenge component I like to look at as like a culminating take action activity at the end of learning. So that's where students are putting all of the knowledge skills um, that they've learned throughout the program or throughout the series of lessons into real measurable action. In Decoding Carbon's case, we actually use a climate policy simulator I'm just going to open up the simulator here for students to create their own climate policy for Canada. So whether you're looking at policy in general or you want to focus in on agriculture and land use or transportation, this is a really cool tool for students to use. So they can actually come in here and um, adjust different factors. So for example, right now I'm adjusting the electric vehicle subsidy um, for passengers. And you can see in real time how that's going to affect the CO2 emissions. There are a number of different factors that you can look at. This tool is extremely dynamic. And if this looks overwhelming, um, it's not. We give you all the tools and step-by-step -step guides for students on how to use this tool, how to adjust the different factors, how to save this information and interpret it. Um, so everything is built in there. It's all scaffolded for you. Um, but I would highly recommend checking out simulators as a really great tool um, for engaging your students in learning. From here, students actually create their own climate policy. So I'm just going to show you our decoding carbon submissions from last year. So this is a brand new program that just launched last year, um, kind of at the peak of the pandemic, right when things went a little south. Um, and teachers were actually able to do this entire program completely virtually. So this is a distance friendly program in its entirety. So here you can see some students actually wrote out a full policy. So they took that climate, that information from the climate policy simulator and they wrote it out in document form. We had some other students showcase with a video. So the way you showcase your information is also dynamic. Best part about our challenges is that you have the opportunity to win cash prizes for participation. So if you do this challenge and your students create a climate policy for Canada and you submit it back to us, you have a chance to win a grand prize of $1,000. Second prize is $500, third prize is $250. And that money can be used with whatever you want, whether that's you want to um, make some sustainable choices for your classroom or your school, or you wanna invest in other learning materials. Um, that's really up to you how you take and use that money. The next program that I'm going to showcase is our Extreme Weather Preparedness Program. This is our Flood Ed Program. This is a personal favorite of mine because I love that it's really rooted in math and science. Um, as a, somebody who really loves math, that's really exciting for me. So this program looks at what is flooding, how can we combat flooding? Unlike the decoding pro carbon program, this isn't broken up into modules. This is broken up into two different sections. We have learning activities, which is where students get that foundational knowledge. And then we have take action activities where students have the opportunity to make a measurable impact. So I'm just going to showcase a couple of my favorite activities within this program. The first thing I wanna showcase is our digital photo gallery. So when we're talking about flooding infrastructure, even as educators and adults, that's not necessarily familiar conversational topics or familiar knowledge. So not only do we have um, within our additional resources here, a key terms guide, and this can be used by both students and teachers, but we also have a photo gallery. So if you aren't familiar with what culverts are or swales or how to identify the permeability of surface area, we cover all of that information here for you. This can also be passed along to students to use. So one of the activities we have here is where students are mapping the flooding infrastructure in their community. So where do they find grates and downspouts? Where is all of that found within their community? And they can use this tool in order to do that scavenger hunt or that activity. This also connects to um, how 
extreme weather is impacting climate change. So looking at the pollution of grates, for example, and how stormwater runoff is impacting uh, pollution leading into our water streams which leads me into my personal favorite activity, which is the runoff footprint. And I was lucky enough, Andriana and I actually did a workshop yesterday um, with some classrooms from across Canada, virtually we logged on with them and went through calculating the, the surface permeability of their school. So what we did, and for those of you who aren't sure, um, permeability is basically whether or not the water can be absorbed into the ground. So in nature, obviously grass, trees, forests, when it rains, that water just gets absorbed into the ground. Unfortunately, in urban areas, oftentimes concrete or asphalt can't absorb water, which means it needs to run off somewhere else. And that's what we want to look at with students. So in that, we actually had students use Google Maps, and I'll show you my map here that I made, to measure the distance around their school. So you can see here, around my school, I have three different colors that I've identified. And I've identified the non-permeable surfaces, the semi-permeable surfaces in yellow and the permeable surfaces in green. So not only did we create this map, we also used the measurement tool on Google Maps in order to calculate the surface, the exact surface area of each of these, which then led us to calculating our runoff footprint. Now, unfortunately, we didn't get all the way to this point yesterday, um, but this is the next step for those students to take that learning. So we actually have a digital runoff calculator built into our program. So you don't have to worry about coming up with these complicated formulas and giving those to your students. We have the calculator built in. So students can actually take the rainfall amounts in their local area, input the information about the surface area of their school, and they can calculate the liters of water that are being run off there. Hey, From Sydney, there, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, just we had a, a question in the chat about what grades you were working with with that project. Awesome. So most of our programs are for grades 4 to 12. This particular program is for grades 4 to 12. Um, the decoding carbon program, I apologize, was for grades 9 to 12. Um, it has been used in some younger grades, bits and pieces of it, but that's our primary target audience. Um, I will be sure to outline the um, grades and subject areas. So thank you very much moving forward. So that this particular one is for grades 4 to 12. Awesome. Um, so from there, you can actually decide how you're going to take action to make your school become more resilient to flooding or protect your school against flooding. So that brings me to the Flood Ed Challenge. So the Flood Ed Challenge basically puts all of the students learning again into action. And we give you a number of different ideas to get started on how you can take action to protect your school against flooding. The first being installing a rain barrel. So after you've decided, okay, this is how many liters of water are currently being run off of our school or run off of our property, how can we capture that water and how we can we divert it to use it for something else? For example, gardening, uh, watering your garden or planting trees. Uh, my personal favorite is the adopt a drain campaign where students actually adopt a drain in their local community and they commit to keeping that drain clean. So obviously we know that water, when it rains, that water can pick up all kinds of dirt, debris and toxins, which then leads it right into our water system. So not only do they commit to cleaning that up, but they also commit to educating their community about that rate. The flood protect your home and flood protect or scavenger hunt are also fantastic activities to connect the learning back to the home again. Um, this one actually makes use of a digital tool, uh, let me see here, of the Home Flood Protector Protection Checkup app. And I'll tell you, I've personally used this app for my home. Um, so it's a series of questions about your home, about um, how you are resilient to flooding. And then at the end, it gives you a full report of how well protected your home is and what steps you could take to improve your home's um, flood protection. So a really great tool. Again, I've used it personally, but you can also guide your students through. So if they're learning at home, you can make that learning really relevant to their to their exact location. So again, you can take the flood ed challenge here. Um, you can do one of these activities or you can make a plan to do one of these activities and hopefully your plan is chosen as one of the prize winners and you can use that money to actually invest in things like rain barrels or flooding infrastructure for your school. The next two programs I'm going to showcase are our energy programs. And these programs are both suitable for grades four to um, 12, and they hit the subjects um, science, math, and social studies for the most part. But um, we use an interdisciplinary approach, so you can connect to so many different subject areas as well. 
This is one of our programs that does require a password to log in. All of our resources are completely free, but some of them do require password access, and this is one of them. So you can just request a, um, a login very easily through here. Now, this program makes use of a lot of um, tools uh, metering technology. So if you have any type of circuit level um, or uh, utility level energy metering technology at your school, so that's where it's keeping track of how much energy is being used, or you have one of these handy watt meters that can um, manually track energy use, or you have no technology at all, we have activities for you. The first tool I want to showcase in this program is our energy calculators. So these were specifically created for this program. Currently, we only have calculators for Alberta and Ontario specific, but we do have a national calculator in the works right now. I'm actually going to showcase both of them for you today, um, just to show you a bit of the difference. So this calculator is going to show me, based on the watts and minutes used per day of any device I choose, the uh, kilowatt hours that I'm using, the kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions, and the cost, the financial cost. And all of this information is explained right underneath here. So the information I love to use is I always go to my blow dryer. So at, it max, at my blow dryer's max setting, it uses about 1200 watts. And I use it for about 10 minutes a day. So if I was to calculate that, if I was living in Ontario, or Alberta, sorry, that would be equivalent to 73 kilowatt hours 60 kilograms of greenhouse gases being produced yearly, and it would cost me just under $5. Now, if I were to do the same thing with the Ontario calculator, you can see the difference in how we source our energy. So for example, I'm taking that 1200 watts for 10 minutes, and you can see I'm actually producing significantly less um, emissions, but it's costing me almost double in order to use that energy. So there's all different types of conversations that can come about from using this tool. Um, all, almost all of our um, activities make use of this tool. It's very dynamic. Um, my favorite activity is actually Speak for the Trees, where we compare students' energy use to the amount of emissions or CO2 that a tree can absorb in a year. So for example, the average tree can absorb 21 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions per year. So looking at even just my blow dryer use, I'm using, multi I'm using multiple trees capacity to absorb that emission every single year. Then students can use this calculator to determine how can I lower my emissions. So for example, what if I started timing myself and I reduced my blow dryer use even by two minutes a day? Look at the significant difference that that makes. Right? So what changes can you make? Use this calculator as a dynamic tool. Within the Energy Revealed program, we also have a number of different um, take action activities and grab and go activities. So if you're looking for a quick activity, you don't have any time to plan, you have a class in a half an hour, you can come here and just grab a quick grab and go activity. That's the student worksheet is ready to go. Um, it doesn't require really any preparation. We also have inquiry and take action activities, which require the students to do a little bit more high level thinking. Typically they're doing their own research um, or it requires them to take measurable action. So you can go through all of these programs or all of these lessons. The phantom load happens to be a favorite. So that's where um, students are looking at devices that suck energy when they're not even on. So for example, your TV, even when you're not watching it, just by it being plugged in, oftentimes sucks energy. So looking at different ways that students can conserve energy without even reducing their uh, energy use is really awesome. So a great uh, program and a really popular program for us. On our YouTube page, we also have a number of different guided lessons. So if you want your students to be learning asynchronously, for example, we have guided lessons specifically for students. So if uh, you can assign this video and what students do is they log in, watch the video, and we'll actually ask them to pause the video at certain parts where they need to take action or do a hands-on part of the activity and then come back and hit play when they're ready to continue. So I encourage you to make use of this tool. We also have all kinds of professional development for educators here. So if you're looking, um, for example, for our decoding carbon program, we hosted a panel with a number of folks who talked about climate policy specifically here in Canada. So um, make use of this tool as well. We are constantly adding new videos, um, new webinars, more information here. Um, so you can check that out as well. 
The second energy program, um, which is by far our most popular program in our repertoire of over 150 resources, um, is our renewable energy program. And this might sound familiar as our solar oven uh, challenge. Um, so it has recently expanded to include a number of different renewable energy technologies, not just solar heat. So as you can see, we have seven different models here or different um, modules that students can work within. And we're also constantly adding to this as well. So to show you a little bit about what's included in this program in the solar oven, we have background information. So again, this is student friendly. So you can hand these backgrounders directly to your students to get that knowledge. We have construction plans to give your students a base of where to start for building this renewable energy technology. So this is a really STEM based program where we want students hands on building and learning. We also have even recipes included in here and students can check out showcases from over the past decade of what other students have done and use that to build off of and continue to innovate and improve their plans. So we have this for each one of these sections or each one of these modules, sorry, or types of technology. But with COVID and everything happening right now with distance learning, obviously hands-on building collaboratively can be really challenging. So I'm going to showcase a couple of digital tools that you can use to get around that and still make the learning really meaningful for students. Uh, the first is a simulator. So we have a number of simulators in our repertoire and unfortunately with the death of Flash at the end of 2020 we lost capabilities with a number of our simulators and are just working now on getting those rebuilt. So if you are familiar with green learning and there's a simulator that isn't currently working know that we're, um, we're on it and hopefully that'll be up and running soon. But for now, we do have a few that are working. So for example, if you're looking at wind energy with your students, instead of just reading yeah. about wind energy, they can actually explore by adjusting the speed, the, the, the wind direction, and they can discover yeah. all different things here about wind turbines and wind energy. In addition to simulators, I really love using digital tools such as 3D, um, 3D software. So this particular one is called Tinkercad and it is a very dynamic software. So I'm just going to show you an example here of a student's solar oven that they built completely digitally. Now, looking at this tool from a user perspective, it's really handy also to make things a little bit more equitable for students who are learning at home. So for example, if you want your students using common household items to create, for example, a solar oven, you can use this making at home feature in the Tinkercad software so that they all have the same starting base. Um, so that's a really great feature. Within Tinkercad, you can also, um, uh, work with circuits, which are simulators. So and there, there are videos and everything within Tinkercad to show you exactly how to do that. Um, but the, oh, where are the circuits? I've lost them now. But there is some circuit learning. So your students can actually build, put together circuits. They don't need to be hands on with that. Everything can be done right within here. The models that your students build can also be 3D printed. So if you have access to a 3D printer at your secondary school or even local community center or library, your students can 3D print parts for their renewable energy model or even the whole renewable energy model, which is really fantastic. Another thing I want to showcase for renewable energy, and this goes actually for all of our programs, is that unfortunately we can't go and have a look at wind turbines anymore or go visit a hydroelectric dam, but we can have the next best thing, which is a virtual tour. So this personal, uh, this one is specifically a virtual dam. Um, and here you can actually go through the entire process. So if you want your students looking specifically at the turbines, you can zoom right into there. Have your students do this asynchronously. Maybe you have them on a scavenger hunt to find information throughout the digital tour, or you're going through it with them together. Another great opportunity is to connect with an expert. So Green Learning and a number of different organizations that we partner with have connections across Canada with different um, renewable energy experts and experts in different fields in the green field um, that we can connect you with that can actually come and visit you in your classroom. Students love having a different voice in the classroom. It's helpful for you as well. We don't expect you to be the keeper of all knowledge, specifically with um, things like renewable energy technology and climate change that are constantly changing. So it's really awesome for students to connect with an expert, gives them also the opportunity to ask questions about future um, professional opportunities or work opportunities. 
The last program that I'm going to showcase before I give you an opportunity to um, play around with some of these is, oh, and I just closed it by accident, is our Eco360 program. This is a brand new program that actually just launched this week, so we're really excited about it. And it's all about circular economy. And the first module in this program is about plastics. So I'm just going to let this load for one second and showcase for you what this program can do. Now, this is our new learning management software that this program is in, um, which eventually all of our programs will be uh, moved over into. So I want to showcase for you how exactly that can be of use for you in your classroom. So within here, we have a number of different lessons that students can explore. You can use to build your own personalized learning plan for your students. Not only that, but it'll actually keep track of exactly where you are within that lesson. So if you've started a lesson and you need to come back to it at a later date with your students, this will actually keep track of exactly where you are with that. So just to show you a little bit of what this looks like, I'm going to go into the activity, what is a circular economy? So within here, again, we have the, you can download the activity via PDF if that's how you prefer to learn, or if you're assigning this for a supply teacher. We have activity backgrounds, educator guides, student worksheets, all available for download on this form. Um, sorry, this program is for uh, secondary students, so grade nine to 12 primarily, and it hits subjects, science, social studies. Um, those are the two primary. It also does hit a quite a few subject areas in grade seven and eight. Um, so within here, if I was to actually open this program, I could open this with my students. So this particular activity starts with a couple of videos. So I can actually open up this activity, watch this video right within the program and move through the lesson just like this. Okay, now when I get to a discussion piece, so where we're discussing about the video we just watched, I can actually right click and make notes right within here. So if some students had some really great questions or maybe um, you wanted to make notes about what they're saying, you can use this sticky note feature here or the highlight feature to focus in on different things. And I'm not sure why the sticky note feature isn't working right now. I did test it out earlier and it was working really well We'll look into that, but you can make notes right within this system and navigate the lessons right within here. So everything you need is in one place. It keeps track of your progress for you as well. So I would use this as a teacher for my own um, simplicity and knowledge of organizing tasks. Okay. So I know I just threw a ton of information at you, a ton of digital resources and ideas and information. So what I wanted to do right now is give you the next 10 minutes of our, uh, of our time together, the opportunity to ask questions. I encourage you if there was a particular digital tool that sparked your interest or a particular program that you're interested in um, to revisit that and, and explore it while we're here to support you and, and answer any questions you may have. Um, I did just remember that I forgot to talk about the circular economy or the Eco360 challenge. So this challenge is where students um, actually propose a innovative solution or come up with an innovative plan for a good, a service, or even a company that incorporates a circular economic model with the goal of eliminating plastic waste from our environment. So this is the opportunity for students to be really creative. And I'll tell you right now, I was talking about circular economy and plastics earlier this week with a Toronto school board. And I had some students extremely excited about the opportunity to innovate with plastics and talking about how they could use eco bricks for different armor and different ideas. So students are really interested in this topic, probably um, the most interest I've seen in a program um, comes from plastics and the environment. Um, so I encourage you to register for what for one of our challenges um, by registering. You also get all kinds of additional resources. Um, you get myself who will support you throughout um, answering any questions you have, guiding you, helping you with your learning plan or anything else that you need. So that's um, the bulk of what I wanted to showcase for you today. So um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to throw them in the chat, which we'll get to now, or you can unmute yourself. Um, if you wanna use that digital handout to revisit any tools, or you'd like me to showcase for you how any of those tools work um, a little bit more in depth, I'm really happy to do so. 
Um, so I see there is a question about logging into Tinkercad. So if students would like to save their work, which I would highly recommend they do, you do need a login for Tinkercad. Um, this has been a question in a number of boards, um, whether or not students do need a login. It hasn't come up as an issue for a lot of boards. If you find that that is an issue, um, that's really great feedback for us to know um, as we recommend these tools. Um, so yes, they do need a login. That is for saving their project so they can come back to it later. Um, is it hosted in Canada? I am not sure. I cannot confirm that. I would have to double check. Um, looking at the website right now, it is .com, though that doesn't necessarily mean um, it's hosted in the States, though um, that's a fairly safe indication of that. Um, if you have, if it seems to be lots of interest in Tinkercad, I'm happy to um, go through this a little bit more with you if you'd like um, and showcase some of the, the activities that we've done with it um, or what you can do with it if that's of interest. Um, please just let us know in the chat or um, again, you're welcome to unmute yourself and um, open discussion here. I have a question, but it's not about Tinkercad. Um, no, no, so does any, I'll leave it for a second in case somebody else wants to ask another question about Tinkercad. No. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. I, I um, oh, was interested sorry. in Tinkercad, but if it's not hosted in Canada, it's a little complex for me to get my student permissions. So I'll just try to look into that and then see. So at this time, it probably um, I'll explore that if that's something I'm allowed to use. So please do continue on. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. And we'd love to hear if um, if you do get feedback that you're not able to use that. Um, we haven't had that yet. So if that is a, a barrier, then we'll definitely be looking for other digital tools that, that educators can, can use here in Canada as well. So we'd appreciate any feedback you have on that. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, Jennifer, if you wanted to go ahead and ask your non-Tinkercad related question. Okay, sure. Um, my question is, how do you recommend using your resources in an LMS? Do you have packages or do, do you recommend just using links or how does that work? Um, so it's really dynamic depending on how educators want to use things. So um, typically they'll drop them if they're using, for example, Google Classroom, they'll drop the, the documents right into their Google Classroom or um, connect the links. Um, it, it really depends on what learning software you're using. Do you happen to have an example of anything that you're using? Canvas in our school district or our school and our district. Okay. Um, I'm actually not familiar with Canvas. I don't know, Andriana, if you are, um, but it really depends educator for educator. We don't even find any consistency among um, educators who use the same tools. Um, it really just yeah, depends fair enough. on how they find it best to use. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Did anyone else have any questions about? Um, oh, a question about Moodle. You're on Moodle. Um, I'm not familiar with Moodle either. Let me just have a quick look at Moodle and we can see what um, that looks like. Oh, it seems like quite a few of you are on Moodle. That must be quite popular out West. That's awesome. So our, our resources do come um, not in a package where they're all in one uh, kind of PDF or anything like that, but they are organized into um, really comprehensive um, I guess, sections. So anything you need will be readily downloadable um, right on the lesson outline. Um, and then anything you need for the activity is either linked right in that document that outlines the step-by-step -step process for the activity. Let me see if I can find one that has maybe a few more links here. So that one still has the activity in the backgrounder. Um, but typically if there was any um, additional sources, um, infographics, worksheets or anything like that, they would all be linked here, including rubrics. Um, embeddable. That's a great question, Andriana. I'm not sure if you know if our interactives are embeddable. I'm not sure, sorry, but it's definitely sure. something that. Um, um, but we can find that information for you, Roz. Um, if you don't mind just direct messaging your email to Andriana, um, we can follow up with you on the answer to that question um, and just make sure that they are downloadable. Um, I know we did actually launch a brand new website this week, um, which has been really exciting for us. We've had a lot of launches this week and a lot of changes and we're looking to really improve um, how this works. So if embeddable interactives is something you're looking for, that's something 
we can bring into that conversation as we continue to develop our new website. So um, thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for that. That's really awesome. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I find that when I'm designing my um, classes that if I have, if I need permissions for students for one, then that becomes a barrier. If I'm sending them to other sites, um, chances are that might become a barrier as well. So the more I can keep on my program um, and the interactives are fantastic and those ones look really cool that you're using. So if there's a way for me to actually put that all in my site um, and then it would be like reference to you, I just find that it's more likely my students will actually do those activities so that's why i'm asking those questions <laughs> no that's uh that those are great that's great feedback and good to know how educators are using things obviously there's been a really big pivot in the last year and so hearing how you're using them and what you need is really important for us to do our job as well this is all free. So everything I have showcased for you today is 100% free. And if you need support in incorporating this, or there's a program that you saw that you um, really sparked your interest and you want to know more, I'm happy to sit down with you um, through uh, a Google Meet or through Zoom and actually go through the program with you so you can better understand what's involved, how you can incorporate it into your classroom and work through any adaptations or barriers that you might have as well. Um, so. I know we're kind of getting to the end of our time here, so I want to thank you all so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic Earth Day and enjoy the rest of the symposium and learn lots. Um, I encourage you to leave your feedback. Um, we're always looking to hear more information. If you want to join our newsletter or keep in contact with us, again, you can direct message your email and name to Andriana, and um, she will get you on our newsletter. So you're the first to hear about when any new simulations or programs or resources come out, which are constantly being developed. So. That's awesome. I do, um, we do do quite a bit of professional development with organizations, particularly with school boards. Um, we partner with them quite often um, to make use, for example, if you're installing solar panels into your school or you've just installed metering technology that you want your educators to be using, um, we can come in and support um, with the programming side of things on how you're, you can engage your educators with that. So we do do professional development opportunities. So um, again, if you want to um, get in contact with me my email is on the bottom of that digital handout um, that was given at the beginning um, so you're welcome to email me anytime especially if you have questions about any of our resources that i showcased here today um, or you want to follow up on anything um, i'd love to hear from you it's always great to connect with educators especially out west um, we're just starting to really get into british columbia so it's really awesome to, to see you all here thank you awesome. so much that was great i really learned a lot and I'm really excited about your resources so I'll definitely be looking into how to use them in my courses. Awesome well thank you so much. Um, well I'll hang out for another minute or so in case you have any questions but I know um, you probably all want to break before your next session so. Thanks so much Sydney. Um, I just feel like I could learn about this all day. I felt like this is just my favorite. I feel super engaged. So your title engagement manager is very fitting. Uh, well done. Um, I just wanted to say um, for me, like I'm usually teaching senior sciences like physics and mathematics. So would you, I mean, you've got so much great stuff here but you know it really well. So if I had a one starting place where would you suggest I start if, it, if they're quite senior level students? Um, so for, Physics, I would probably start with the renewable energy program and looking at, um, for example, the wind turbine and the aerodynamics of that um, would be a great place to start. Okay, For math, um, I would definitely start with our energy programs as well, looking at um, graphing different energy, um, graphing and there's just so much you can do with energy information and that data that's available. Um, that's where I would really start. Our Eco360 program is designed for higher level um, sciences. So that chemistry and biology mostly, um, but I believe it does hit on some other high level ones, but our intent with that program was really to get those grade 11 and 12 some resources um, for climate change education. So I would highly encourage you to check that out and I'm happy to again, go through that with you. Okay, thanks so much. No problem. 
Yes. If, um, so for those of you in BC, your calculator would actually be closest to Ontario, um, seeing as we also use primarily hydroelectric energy. So in obviously Alberta, there's a big difference there in how they source their energy. So if you are choosing between one or the other, um, for BC, Ontario would be a more accurate um, calculator. But again, join our mailing list and we'll let you know once that national calculator has been finished. So. Thank you everyone so much. This is the end of our time together. Um, I hope to hear from any or all of you very soon and um, we'd love to hear any feedback you have. There is a feedback form built right into the schedule or the sked.com platform. So um, feel free to leave your comments, questions or any feedback you have for us there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.